Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Arbitrage Risk and Opportunities in the Current Market. This is a webinar produced by the California Debt and Investment Advisory Commission. We're glad that you could join us this morning. I'm Robert Berry, the Executive Director here at CDAC. Arbitrage management is a critical element of post-bond issuance administration. Uh, the investment of bond proceeds and staying on the right side of the IRS requirements for maintaining the tax-exempt status of your bonds is, is and has always been a standard element of CDX educational curriculum. Among other resources, there's a chapter on it in our debt financing guide and has always been a featured topic in our educational programs. But never really has, it, has the topic been hotter in the public finance world than right now. Short-term interest rates, the shape of the yield curve, current and expected economic conditions, and the potential of Fed action or inaction have combined to create an environment for earning substantial positive arbitrage on your bond proceeds. These are market conditions that I expect most of you that are participating this morning have not lived through, let alone experienced in your careers as public finance professionals. Remember, it was, it was less than four years ago that the public finance community in California successfully advocated for a change in the investment statutes that allowed for the investment of US in US government securities that could result in a zero or negative interest accrual if held to maturity. So what is CDX trying to achieve in bringing in this webinar today? After all, there's been a great deal of discussion about this topic in, in other venues. Well, first, our first objective is to help you all sharpen up your understanding of arbitrage and rebate and help you to recognize the risks and responsibilities that come with managing this, this phenomenon presented by this market. But second, and just as important as staying vigilant about your responsibilities, is to help you recognize that the market conditions present real opportunities to use positive arbitrage as a strategic element of your various plans of finance, both with recently issued debt and, and future borrowing structures. And we, the CDEC's education team, our education team has, has assembled a great faculty panel uh, this morning, ready to tackle these, both these objectives. But before I introduce our faculty team and we get started, just allow me to run down um, some of the standard webinar housekeeping items. First, the slides. Uh, people ask where the slides are. They're available in the link in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar control panel. So that's in the handouts section. Uh, we also will have them posted to our event page on our website. That's the same page that you use to register for the webinar, uh, available off the front page of CDX website in the left column under educational opportunities. Then questions. So use your questions box in the control panel to submit a question anytime during the program. Sometimes it's better to jot it down uh, when you think of them. Uh, I'll interject at different points in the program uh, to ask the panelists questions. And then we've also planned some time at the end of the program for some additional questions that come through. We have a captioning service that's accessible through the linked address in the chat section of the control panel. Uh, if you participate in 70% of the webinar, we'll send you a certificate of attendance just in a couple of weeks. And then also in a couple of weeks, we'll make a full replay of the program available in CDX education portal. Uh, we'll send you a notification uh, when it's ready and then a link when it's plugged into the portal and ready for viewing. So if you have technical problems, um, GoToWebinar can help you uh, to an extent on the number uh, or link on the screen. Um, having said that, and after hosting a few of these webinars, I think often the best solution for audio problems or connection issues is, is simply to exit the webinar and then, and then rejoin. So with that, now I'd like to welcome and introduce our three distinguished presenters. First, we have Craig Hill, Managing Principal of NHA Advisors. Craig has been in public finance since 1989 and is a founding partner of NHA Advisors. He advises cities, counties, special districts, and K-12 school districts throughout the state. His financial advisory practice also includes financial policies, financial planning, and capital project funding strategies. Craig has been a frequent presenter with CDX programs over the years. Then joining Craig this morning is John Stanley, partner with Oric, Harrington, and Sutcliffe. John focuses his practice on the tax aspects of municipal finance. In his practice, John has served as bond counsel, special tax counsel, and underwriters counsel for a variety of municipal financings. John has represented issuers and borrowers before the Internal Revenue Service and work with issuers to establish post-issuance compliance programs tailored to their specific financings. Then rounding out our panel and to get us started by framing up the current market conditions is Simon Warecki. 
Simon is head of the Western Region for Municipal Finance and Managing Director for Jefferies. Simon has over 15 years of public finance experience and previously served as a senior banker at Bank of America and Goldman Sachs. Over his career, Simon has lead managed over $5 billion in financings for issuers across California and the West. So we'll kick it off with Simon. All right, uh, thank you, Robert. Appreciate the introduction and nice to be with everyone today. You know, Angel, if we could go to the next slide. What, what we thought we would do is frame some of what Robert just hit on in terms of sort of the current market conditions that make arbitrage, you know, both its risks and opportunities, such a relevant topic for our municipal issuers. And at the most fundamental level, I think it's important to understand, you know, what is arbitrage? And that's really the ability to profit from buying something in one market and selling it in another. And throughout, you know, the history of finance, there are all kinds of interesting arbitrage opportunities that, uh, you know, investors and issuers have capitalized on. But for the vast majority of our audience today, you know, municipal issuers, arbitrage really comes up as a result of your ability to issue tax exempt bonds. And the value that tax exemption affords to investors allows you to sell bonds at yields that generally, or in a normal market condition, are well below you know, where that same equivalent bond would price if it didn't have the tax exempt component to it, i.e. if it were taxable and an investor who bought it had a tax liability associated with the interest that bond paid. And really it's as a result of this dynamic that arbitrage creates lots of risks, but also plenty of opportunities for municipal issuers. And you know, absent uh, the, the rules and regulations that John's gonna discuss momentarily, there really is a very interesting opportunity in the current market to issue tax exempt bonds at relatively low rates and reinvest the proceeds in what are fundamentally taxable bonds at higher rates and create an arbitrage profit, which can potentially be retained by a municipal issuer or which may need to be rebated back. So that's the, the market dynamic we wanna to discuss today. Um, and, and this is most relevant for you because you know, where you can borrow, either have borrowed historically or can as a tax exempt borrower, is very different than where you can reinvest those proceeds now. And this applies to bonds that have been issued in the past or prospectively bonds that you're thinking about issuing today, whether for new projects or even for refunding purposes. And, and fundamentally, it's this dynamic between where tax exempt borrowing rates have been and are today and, and where taxable reinvestment rates are that creates this, this very unique arbitrage dynamic that as Craig will discuss, we really haven't seen in, in 15 or 20 years and probably for many people on the call, these, these topics are new, um, new dynamics to consider. So on the next slide, you know, here we, we give a snapshot of tax exempt borrowing costs. And we use 20 year MMD, which is sort of the AAA uh, risk free municipal index, as a proxy for where long term average borrowing costs have been for tax exempt issuers. And, and as you can see, and as everyone knows, you know, rates have certainly risen materially since COVID, but there are really two dynamics that are worth pointing out. You know, rates currently really aren't that much higher than they were um, five years ago, as you see sort of where the chart starts and where it ends. And two, there's this period in the middle where rates were extremely low. And there are a significant number of issuers out there, presumably many on this call, who have bond proceeds that were issued at yields that are way below where current market rates are. So it creates this, this interesting opportunity. Um, on the next slide, we get into the what I think are the more important dynamics for this discussion, and it's the relative rates between where you can or did borrow tax exempt on the top and where you can reinvest those proceeds. And we use treasuries as a proxy on the bottom for that discussion. So when we look at the top, this is the yield curve, uh, the AAA MMD yield curve, both 
its current level in uh, light blue, and then the 10 and 20 year averages in dark blue and gold, respectively. And those are the points along the curve. Again, we use the 20 year as an average proxy, but this shows at all points on the yield curve, sort of where relative borrowing costs are. And I think when we start on the top and we look at tax exempt borrowing costs, a few things stand out. You know, one, the current yield curve is inverted on the very front end, right? So when we look at the, the, the light blue line, you see sort of one through nine, rates are actually declining. And that is abnormal from a historical perspective. But once we get out past eight, nine, 10 years, the curve uh, de-inverts and we have a normal upward sloping yield curve. So I think that's that's relevant. Two, you know, when you look at where rates are, well, they are certainly higher than, than they'd been over the past few years. We're really at or below our 20 year average in MMD borrowing costs. So from a historical perspective, rates are, one could say average, higher than their 10 year average, but really at their 20 year average in aggregate as a tax exempt borrower. But when we look at the bottom, you know, we see a very different dynamic in the taxable market. So again, colors representing the same time periods, the light blue line, current snapshot of US treasury yield. So a proxy for sort of risk-free taxable reinvestment. We see that same inversion on the front end of the curve, right? Where, where the, the one year and even the shorter treasury rates are materially higher than as you move out longer. But two, we see a significant divergence from the historical averages. So current treasury rates are very elevated from where they have been historically, whether you look out 10 years or 20 years. And what that means is from a municipal borrowing perspective, we're sort of at our 20 year average, but from a taxable borrowing perspective, or more importantly, from a taxable reinvestment perspective, we are well above our current tax exempt rates and our 10 and 20 year averages. And you know what this chart doesn't capture, but I think is also really important is, is what the Fed has done. Um, and you know, one year treasury rates are a, a relatively good proxy for where you could reinvest proceeds but it's really the Fed funds rate that drives a lot of very short-term reinvestment, particularly in money market funds and others. And you know, for those who have tracked the Fed, Fed funds is the most important indicator the Fed uses to drive overall rates. And what you remember is from 2008 to 2016, the Fed funds rate was virtually zero. So we were in a point where very short-term rates were almost zero for almost 10 years. And what that meant was the ability to reinvest proceeds that you needed immediate access to meant you were earning almost zero for a really long period of time. And that trend has obviously reversed itself very dramatically. And so I think when you look at the bottom of this chart and you look at where treasury rates are, you know, most issuers are not looking at borrowing taxably long-term. They're thinking about investing their tax exempt proceeds on the short end of the taxable curve. And that blue line between, you know, whether you look at zero or one, two or three, is why this dynamic exists where there is the potential for such significant positive arbitrage. Because whether it's, you know, a current Fed funds rate north of five or treasury rates even a little farther out on the curve, still well above 4%, all of those taxable reinvestment rates are well above where most tax exempt borrowers are borrowing in the, in the uh, tax exempt markets. So that's, that's why we are in this dynamic that arbitrage is so relevant and needs to be considered as a key component of you know, managing your bond programs, both pro historically and prospectively. Next slide. So the last slide um, is sort of captures some element of the dynamic between these two markets. And what we've charted here is the difference between a one-year treasury, again, use, using one-year treasury as a proxy for where bond proceeds could be reinvested taxably, and 20-year MMD, or a proxy for where long-term tax-exempt bond issues uh, yields are. And you know we we show this from 2019 
to present. If you ran this back even further, what you would see is that difference historically for, the, for a long period had been at or below zero, meaning arbitrage wasn't particularly relevant because even if you wanted to, there were not short-term taxable investment opportunities at yields that were above where your bond yield would have been. But what you see is that that trend really has reversed itself. And when we remember on the first slide, it was really in 2022 that rates started going up materially. And we saw that in tax exempt rates, but we certainly saw that with treasury rates as well. And as a result, this delta or this difference between where your overall bond yield is and where you can reinvest funds has continued to grow. And even as the Fed has talked about lowering rates and even as longer rates have come down, tax exempt bonds have continued to price at relatively better yields. And so this delta or this difference has continued to grow. And you see here, this is you know well north of 100 basis points of just sort of natural reinvestment gain um, that is very relevant to the discussion that we're going to have today. So I will, I will end there on the current market dynamic um, and turn it over to John to talk about why this dynamic uh, is so important to issuers from uh, managing your, your tax and rebate liability perspective. Thanks, Simon. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to cover sort of the technical tax rules that relate to arbitrage and rebate. Um, and, and we refer to them as arbitrage rebate. Sometimes it's just arbitrage. Sometimes people just say rebate. But there's actually two different sets of rules that apply. And we're going to cover why it's important to understand both of those sets of rules. Um, from, a, from a big picture perspective, these rules are coming about or came about because uh, issuers were doing things that Congress felt was inappropriate. Uh, for example, as Simon said, you can borrow at a federally subsidized tax exempt rate and then invest the money at a taxable rate and earn money. Um, and, you know, going back to the, the 60s, issuers did that and, you know, issued more bonds than they needed and just invested the proceeds and kept the excess. And Congress said, you, you can't do that. Uh, and so the arbitrage rules, you know, kind of came about in waves as particular entities were uh, engaging in what I'll call sort of abusive transactions. And so a lot of these rules are kind of written to tamp down on particular situations uh, um, as, as we'll cover in the next slide. Uh, so next slide, please. So, as a general rule, you're not allowed to invest your proceeds of tax exempt bonds in investments with a yield that is materially higher than the yield on the bonds. Um, and materially higher for this purpose is like a, you know, an eighth of a, a percent. So it's, it's pretty small. And the, the materially higher is even smaller in certain situations. While there is that general rule, there are significant important exceptions that apply that do allow you to invest at a higher yield for at least certain periods of time. But the intent of all of these rules is to avoid or restrict situations where an issuer might issue more bonds than they need to, issue bonds earlier than they need to, or keep them outstanding longer than necessary for the project. So, I want, I want to differentiate between some of the arbitrage and rebate rules we're going to talk about and the hedge bond restrictions. Um, the hedge bonds is a separate tax restriction that generally requires an issuer to expect to spend at least 85% of your proceeds within three years or 85% in five years if, if certain requirements are met. Um, while some of that 85% ties into some of the arbitrage issues, it's technically a, a separate uh, a separate issue for purposes of tax exempt bonds. Uh, so next slide. So when we're talking about these limits on how you can invest proceeds and whether or not your investments are going to be subject to yield restriction or rebate, we need to ask the question of what what money are we focused on? And 
the tax rules distinguish between proceeds of the bonds, which are the sale proceeds that you receive when you issue the bonds, as well as investment proceeds, being the earnings on those sale proceeds and earnings on the earnings, uh, as well as transferred proceeds. So transferred proceeds come about when you issue refunding bonds to refund uh, prior bonds that still have unspent money or bond anticipation notes that still have unspent money or other things like that. Those are all treated as proceeds of the bonds. In addition, the arbitrage rules reply to replacement proceeds or gross proceeds. And these include amounts that are not necessarily derived directly from the bonds, but that are other funds that have sufficient nexus to the bonds to be treated as replacement proceeds. So as you set aside debt service money to pay debt service on your tax exempt bonds, those debt service funds become replacement proceeds. You can also have, um, you know, in a situation where there is a reserve fund, uh, if the reserve fund is funded from bond proceeds, then it's proceeds. If you had a cash funded reserve fund, that cash would be treated as replacement proceeds of the tax exempt bonds because it's there to serve as a, uh, a reserve. We've also seen situations with uh, you know, pledged funds or internal sinking funds where sometimes an issuer may decide that it has some surplus cash and it may have debt service due over the next five years and decides to set aside some of that money in its own internal you know, account where it's invested and going to be used to pay debt service. Well, that, that money, if it is sufficiently uh, set aside and designated and exclusively available for that debt service, that effectively becomes replacement proceeds that may also be amounts that are subject to arbitrage and rebate. Uh, in general, you know, these restrictions will apply until the proceeds are spent. And there are some particular rules that get into, you know, when do you treat proceeds as spent? Generally, that's when they're actually, you know, paid to an outside contractor or paid to employees. Um, you know, preliminary bookmarking or, uh, you know, setting aside money for a project fund where the project has where the money hasn't actually been spent yet is generally not sufficient to treat the proceeds as as actually spent next slide so as mentioned earlier there are two sets of arbitrage restrictions uh, one is yield restriction and the other is rebate the general idea of yield restriction is are you allowed to invest your proceeds at a yield higher than the yield on the bonds? Um, as mentioned earlier, the, the general rule is no, but there are significant exceptions. When we're talking about a new money bond that is gonna be issued to fund a project, generally that will qualify for a three-year temporary period. During those three years, you are allowed to invest the bond proceeds at a yield higher than the yield on the bonds. We're gonna focus on that three year temporary period more in some later slides because it, it becomes particularly relevant in the current market conditions. Uh, you may also be familiar, you know, if, if you do a refunding transaction, you're generally allowed to invest your refunding escrow for up to 90 days at an unrestricted yield. Reserve funds are generally allowed to be invested at an unrestricted yield, meaning you, you sort of can earn as much as you want uh, you may not be able to keep it, we're going to get to that, but you are allowed to invest it however you would like to. And for other funds, there is generally a 30-day period for um, during which such proceeds or such amounts can be invested at a yield higher than the yield on the bonds. The second set of rules is rebate. Uh, if you were allowed to invest at a higher yield, do you get to keep the excess? And you get to keep the excess only if you meet an exception. There are some spending exceptions that we will talk about in a, in a few slides, which allow you to keep the excess if you have spent the money quickly enough. There's a small issuer exception, uh, generally for issuers that don't issue more than $5 million in a year. Uh, 
that is expanded to $15 million for certain public school facilities. And then there is a, a debt service fund exception. So amounts that are in a debt service fund, as long as they are sort of put in and drawn out within a sufficiently short period of time to pay debt service, those qualify for an exception from rebate. Next slide. Uh, so as mentioned, these are the most common yield restriction exceptions. These are situations where you are allowed to invest your bond proceeds above the bond yield. Uh, for the three-year temporary period, which I think is where we'll spend most of our time, you must expect to spend 85% of the proceeds within three years. There needs to be a binding obligation to spend at least 5% of the proceeds within six months after the issuance. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to have spent 5% within six months after the issuance, but it means that you need to have a construction contract or other thing in place to put in, to, to have that obligation to spend the money. And you need to proceed with due diligence in spending your proceeds timely. If you do qualify for this three-year temporary period, you are allowed to invest your bond proceeds above the bond yield. But after three years, you're technically no longer allowed to invest above the bond yield. However, there's also a rule that says if you do actually invest above the bond yield and you qualified for that three-year temporary period, you can make yield reduction payments, which sort of pay down the yield, you pay the excess back to the, the federal government, and that treats you as having complied with yield restriction. We'll talk about that a little bit more in some later slides. Um, current refunding bonds, mentioned this, the 90-day temporary period, reserve funds, you're also allowed to invest above the bond yield up to as long as the reserve fund has been sized based on the lesser of three test. No more than 10% of your bond proceeds, no more than 125% of average annual debt service or your maximum annual debt service. And lastly, bona fide debt service funds qualify for an exception from yield restriction if they are uh, depleted annually and the money's held in there and held no longer than 13 months. Next slide. Here, we're gonna cover some of the spending exceptions from rebate. Um, and I wanna say that there's a lot of, we put a lot of words on all of these slides because we wanted you all to have something that you could take away with you and use as a reference. Um, and so, you know, as much as you can understand this as we're talking through it is great, but we do have some case studies as well at the end where we're going to drill down on some of these issues and, and provide a little more context. So if you spend all of your proceeds within six months, you don't owe rebate. Uh, so that allows you to keep, keep anything you earn during that six month period, as long as everything is spent within six months. Outside of refunding transactions, it's fairly unusual in my experience to meet that six month exception. Then there are, are two exceptions that are more likely to be applicable. Uh, one is the 18 month exception. So no rebate is owed if all of your proceeds are spent within 18 months, but you also have to meet these 15% you know, spent within six months and 60% spent within 12 months. Lastly, there is the 24 month exception. This only applies to uh, construction issues. And for this purpose, it has to be construction, not acquisition. And there's some detailed rules that get into, you know, if you're acquiring property to be included in other property, is that a construction or is that an acquisition? And those rules are beyond the scope of, of this presentation. The 24 month exception also only applies to governmental or 501c3 bonds and doesn't apply to um, private activity bonds or other types of exempt facility bonds where you may have private ownership. Um, if you meet these spend down requirements, 10% within six months, 45% within 12 months, 75% within 18 months, and 100% within 24 months, then you can keep any of the mo excess money that you earn during that period. Both the 18 month and the 24 month have 
what I will call de minimis exceptions. So if you end up with a small amount of money left over, um, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars or amounts that are necessary to sort of ensure that contractors complete their punch list items, uh, there can be some ability to, to give you a little bit of wiggle room there. But generally these do require spending of proceeds I'll say more quickly than I've seen in the market over the last 15 years. You know, I think it's not uncommon for issuers to size their bonds based on the amount of money that they will need over the next three years in compliance with the 85% the within three year hedge bond requirement. Um, but if you really are spending your money over three years, you're not gonna qualify for any of these rebate exceptions and anything you do earn above the bond yield is going to need to be paid as rebate. Next slide, please. So here are some timing considerations. Um, you know, rebate is looked at over the entire term of the bonds. So if you uh, earn, you know, 0% for the first year and then 5% for the second year, Assuming you have the same amount of money during both years, you blend it over time to come up with what your average uh, rebate potential liability was, what your average earnings were on your bond proceeds. And so you can have situations where you have a negative liability in certain years and a positive liability in later years, and those can blend out to avoid any need to make a payment. If, you know, but bonds may be outstanding for 30 years, the Treasury regulations require that payments be made no later than five years after issuance. So what you effectively have to do is, by that fifth year, determine what your situation is to date. Have you had a, a net positive or a net negative? And if you have a net positive, you have to make a payment. It doesn't have to be 100% of liability, only has to be 90% of the liability by that fifth year. Then you get to year 10 and you calculate where you are at that point in time. Uh, then again, year 15, year 20, until the bonds are no longer outstanding. So it, it is possible if you have a reserve fund, for example, to have a negative or positive liability for the first five year period, and then maybe interest rates drop back down and you have a negative liability in that second five year period. It is possible to file a refund claim with the IRS and get that difference back. Um, you know, we haven't seen that that leads to any more likely audit of your bonds, but the IRS sometimes will scrutinize that refund claim and, and you know, disagree with some of the calculations. They certainly pay more attention to your refund claim than they do if you were making a payment. Um, while these payments are due at least every five years, I always recommend to, for issuers to be monitoring this on an annual basis. Um, you don't want to get to the fifth bond year and find out that you owe a million dollars and not have money set aside in any budget available for that. And so by doing a, an annual monitoring, that puts you in a position where you can identify potential issues coming up. And as we'll get to in some of the case studies, that can also provide you with the insight and a, a opportunity to make some changes in how you may be investing your bond proceeds in order to try to avoid a liability um, or minimize it in some way. Next slide. So yield restriction is that separate set of rules that governs whether or not you are allowed to invest your bond proceeds above the, the bond yield. It is also blended over time, but there's a particular rule that says you only blend over time when you did not qualify for a temporary period. And this gets a little technical, but, but we really wanted to hit this point. Um, so if you issue new money bonds, you get that initial three-year period where you are allowed to invest above the bond yield. After that period, you're not allowed to, but if you do, you make yield reduction payments. However, when we're blending your, your investment yield for yield restriction purposes, 
we don't get to take into account that three-year period. That three-year period is kind of off to the side. So instead, after the end of three years, we look at, okay, starting fresh now, how have your bond proceeds been invested? And on a blended basis, have they been invested above the bond yield? So we have a case study that gets into this in a little bit. Um, but you know, if, you, if you're coming up on the end of that three-year period, you may have a lot of negative arbitrage on your bond proceeds during those prior three years. But once you get after that three-year period, you don't get the benefit of that for yield restriction calculation purposes. You do for rebate, but not for yield restriction. And so you may end up with a surprise liability. Um, to the extent you have to make yield reduction payments, those are made on the same five-year schedule as rebate payments, so the fifth bond year, and then each five years thereafter. Next slide. There's a few other points we wanted to hit. Um, you know, for when you issue fixed rate bonds, you generally know what your bond yield is on the issue date or on the pricing date usually. Uh, for variable rate bonds, when you are calculating yield restriction and rebate, you recalculate your bond yield as of each five-year period based on what your actual bond rates have been up to that point. You know, I mentioned earlier that a lot of these rules come out of sort of abusive behavior by particular entities. And there's a general requirement that you need to buy investments at fair market value. There are treasury regulations that provide some detailed methods of how you establish fair market value. And in some cases, the IRS can dispute that. The situation has come about that we sometimes refer to as yield burning. And that's the idea of, you know, if you as an issuer of bonds are not allowed to invest your bond proceeds above, say, a 3% bond yield, um, an, an, you know, you could go out and buy some investments and someone who knows that you are limited to a 3% investment return, that you'll have to pay rebate on anything more than that, might say, hey, I'll, I'll give you a 3% investment when fair market value would be 3.5 or four or something higher. Effectively, they're selling you an investment at a below market cost and they get to benefit from the difference. It's referred to as, as yield burning. Um, lately, we've seen this come up, you know, when tax exempt bonds are issued and the proceeds are gonna be held, perhaps, perhaps a private placement with a bank and the bond proceeds are also gonna be held by that bank. Well, let's say the, the yield on the tax exempt bonds is 4% or let, let's go lower, let's say 3%. And the bank says, well, I know you're not gonna be able to keep anything above 3%. So we will just give you a 3% return on the bank account that is holding your bond proceeds. If that's not the fair market value rate currently, then effectively, you know, the bank is getting the benefit of that, that differential. And that's something where the IRS would come in and say, no, 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 you, like, you, you did not acquire those investments in that bank account at fair market value. And therefore there is some imputed investment earnings that are going to the bank. Lastly, and this is something we're gonna cover more as well. Um, if you invest your proceeds in other tax exempt bonds, those are not subject to yield restriction or rebate. Sort of the theory there is tax exempt bonds are out in the market. If you as a non tax paying entity are investing your proceeds in other tax exempt bonds, you are sort of taking them out of the taxpayer market. And so therefore they're not subject to yield restriction or rebate. And there's a particular type of uh, slugs or state and local government securities issued by the US Treasury that are treated as tax exempt bonds for this purpose. Now you may be familiar with slugs when acquiring uh, investments for refunding escrow. And those are usually time deposit slugs where you identify the amount that you wanna buy, the rate that you want to buy them at and the overall you know when they are going to mature relative to when you need your escrow to pay out demand deposit slugs are different 
the interest rate changes daily. They generally can be redeemed on three days notice. Uh, and, you know, they, for this purpose, they are also treated as tax exempt bonds. And so they provide a particular investment opportunity that, that is worth knowing about. Um, it may end up being a situation that makes it easier to deal with some of the arbitrage and rebate limits, particularly for bonds that have been outstanding for more than three years. And so we're going to come back to that in some of the case studies. Next slide, please. And I, I realize that was a lot of material and a lot of technical material. I'm hoping some of it came across. We are going to have some case studies that sort of walk through examples of how some of these apply. But for this, I'm going to turn it over to Craig for this slide. Great. Thanks, John. And uh, I'm going to pose a question to you. You don't have to answer this now, but when you were talking about yield restriction and then talking about permitted investments on that last slide, what constitutes, if somebody's in that yield restriction period, whether they're making an effort to not in accidentally end up in an investment that's above their yield restriction, right? So I'm sure many issuers just have their money in their with their trustee in a money market fund that's fluctuating from month to month. It, you know, is there a situation where if they're not paying attention to it every statement that they get on a monthly basis, all of a sudden they're above the the yield restriction. Is that considered like is does the IRS look negatively on that or just say did just say you just need to clean it up by making a payment to us? So yeah, I mean I think that would be a situation where you know you 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 can't go out and buy you know two percent yielding securities these days because investment rates are just above that. Um, so you do have to acquire things at fair market value. And you're right, if you have your money in a money market fund or other variable rate fund and you're not paying attention and the interest rate on that fund rises above your bond yield, yes, you get to blend over time. And so that may have some benefit, but otherwise, you know, to the extent you're earning above your bond yield, you may have to make yield restriction or rebate payments. Great. You know, Craig, you made the point as we were planning this of, you know, paying yield restriction or rebate is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, do you want to talk about that? Sure. So I think for everything that John just tried to scare you with around all the rules that you have on um, your investments, we're going to, as we start now getting into the, the part of the webinar where we're going to go through some actual numbers and case studies, um, it should be noted that you have a responsibility as a financial manager within your public agency and to your taxpayers to maximize your earnings or maximize the benefit of any financing you're doing. That's just going to give you more proceeds or more earnings to build the project or pay for other um, items. And so it's important to know that you actually do ideally want to try to earn a rebate liability or arbitrage because if you effectively earn more than you're allowed that means you've earned the maximum i don't know anybody personally who can peg their investment strategy exactly at their bond yield and not go a dollar over or a dollar under it's you know you're going to get close depending on what the market conditions are that simon went through at the very beginning so it's it it's you should be shooting for the stars following um, some good recommendation from John about on an annual basis, checking to make sure you, you know, what your rebate liability is. Nobody wants to find out in five years that they owe a million dollars to the federal government when they don't have a million dollars worth of bond proceeds or earnings sitting around anymore. So you do want to be tracking that and setting that aside, but uh, you, you would rather be over by $100,000 than under by $500,000. And we speak with a lot of public agencies who kind of have this intent, well, I, I never wanna pay taxes, I don't wanna pay a rebate liability to the federal government, when in fact, it actually means you're doing your job and, and earning a good amount off of those bond proceeds. And um, as this slide really indicates, um, I'm sure for all of you who have ever issued debt, 
the, the bond counsel and attorneys will always draft your documents with a specific section allowing you to invest in certain things. And, and this is a fairly standard laundry list. We just want to bring to your attention really the bottom two, which are the demand deposit and the tax exempt municipal securities, because for all of the reasons that, that this webinar is intended, that's where your arbitrage opportunity is. That's where you get to play a little bit of a game and potentially earn more than you otherwise would be allowed and keep it. Everything else that's on this list is going to be subject to all of those rules that John just went through, whether it's a rebate liability or rebate calculations, or whether you know it's even subject to yield restriction. Uh, I will say that this does not mean you can go out and buy, just because you've found out you're You've got negative arbitrage on um, your earnings for the last couple of years that you can go out and buy stocks or uh, you know corporate bonds they they do have to kind of fit within this permitted investment section so uh, next slide to start putting some math to the words that you all have just heard um, from john and, and simon it's it's important to know that I think for anybody who hasn't been in this business for the last 18 years, this conversation would, doesn't even make any sense or, or was not relevant. And what we had was, as you can see kind of from the graph, is historically, even when you were borrowing money at 3% rates or 3.5% rates, you weren't really ever in, earning anything near what your cost of funds were. You know, you were down in the sub one percent range. So we call that negative arbitrage. And if you borrow, you borrowed money, and you were spending it down slowly on your project, you just were always behind the curve in terms of trying to um, earn more than what you were allowed to earn. Um, you see where the investment yield has kind of skyrocketed, uh, and what that has created now is a position where it's almost impossible not to be earning positive arbitrage right now. Um, and this is an anomaly that for those of you who have been around for 20 to 30 years, you may remember the day when it, it was just impossible to not earn positive arbitrage. Um, the way the math works though, and this gets back to some of the calculation uh, formulas that John was talking about is it's anticipated that you had the bulk of your bond proceeds earning negative for years. For the last couple of years, uh, you, you just couldn't earn enough, but you're also spending that down. So mathematically today, most likely you have small balances left in, in potentially a project fund or in a construction fund. And while those may be earning positive rates, the actual calculation and the nominal dollars that you're earning are only going to be offsetting the negative arbitrage that you earn. You, you've got such a, a big accrued liability or negative earning opportunity in the past that you probably aren't going to go positive. One of what the studies, case studies we'll talk about here or examples is really what about the issuers who are going into the market today, and you know what should they be thinking about because right out of the gate they're going to skyrocket into a position where there's positive arbitrage. So next slide. We're going to go through um, four examples of some scenarios that may or may not be relevant for any of you that are that are on this webinar. Uh, the first one is really to go through a, an example of an issue that was done a few years ago and you still have unspent proceeds, what to do. The next one's really going to be looking at, I'm going to market sometime in 2024, should I be actually paying attention to this? Because this is something we've never talked about before. We'll get into some of the examples on your short-term accounts, capitalized interest, bond funds. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about even reserve funds. And then one of the real opportunities that kind of goes to the title of this webinar, which is you know, the, the arbitrage example of a current refunding that a lot of public agencies are doing now through their refundings that are really allowing them to capture and increase the total benefit of a refunding through their escrow. So with that, I'll, I'll go to case study one. And just so everybody knows, we're gonna try to make this a little dynamic. Uh, Simon, John, and I are gonna 
tag team across these things. So you you may hear uh, different different comments from different folks. But what we're really trying putting some some math together now for everything that you've hopefully learned in the last half an hour is in this example you've got a 20 million dollar project or financing that you've done you know you you did it back in 2021 at at a rate of around two and a half percent at the time phenomenal rate you were just excited to be borrowing money at a really low interest rate we weren't thinking at all about making money on this project right other than or on this financing other than just getting some token interest earnings off of the construction fund while you're waiting for our purposes this this project didn't have a reserve fund so you don't really have any other big buckets uh, you, you spent your cost of issuance and you're off and running and as john mentioned the way the rules work you you came out of the gate assuming you were going to spend this money on a project so you were eligible for the three-year temporary period, which just meant right out of the gate, you didn't have to lock down that those bond proceeds in a, in a yield-restricted uh, investment strategy. But as we all know, between 2020 and 2024, we've had this thing called COVID and the pandemic. And it has disrupted a lot of what public agencies have tried to do in terms of their capital projects, whether it's a supply chain issue, whether it's just getting contracts, uh, bid and let, or even if it's been a function of just not being able to get the projects implemented or, or going as fast as possible. So in our example, here we are almost four years later or three years later, sorry, and we won't, we've got $10 million left in the project fund because we're behind schedule. Now, the good news is you weren't paying much attention to your project fund because it was not really earning much. As you can see, and we've staked, well, we've quoted some LAFE rates, which most likely may have been where you had these proceeds. For the first year, you were only earning 0.3%. Again, your rebate liability, or sorry, your rebate arbitrage yield is 2.5%. So you were a long way from earning any positive. You were, in effect, uh, leaving a lot of money on the table from an interest earnings perspective. But starting in 22, going into 23 last year, um, the rates really jumped, right? We've all seen how the short-term rates have gone up, and now you're at two and a half or two and a quarter percent. So you're pretty close to what your arbitrage yield is, but from a cumulative perspective, you know you're still negative. Well, you know, second half of last year going into 2024, uh, you can't not make money on any investments that you have. You, you, you put it into a money market fund, it's it's earning over 4%. LAFE is doing well. Every All of the short-term investment, permitted investments are doing really well. So you, you now have a situation where you're actually, on that $10 million that you have sitting there, you're earning 4%. So you're actually in a positive arbitrage environment today compared to what you were you know for the last two years now it's important to note that as as john mentioned if you were doing rebate calculations on an annual basis you would show that you had a big negative after year one a smaller negative in year two but probably finishing year three you know you might be getting close to break even or uh, just have a slightly negative arbitrage rebate but what's going to happen now is you're going to end the three-year period of time and you're going to enter into a new kind of a new window of how you manage this bond proceeds so if we can go to the next slide and john do you want to talk just a little bit about what happens on july 1 2024 yeah so we talked earlier about that that three-year temporary period so for for rebate purposes you get to blend that 0.25% or 0.3% yield, that 2.25% yield or 2.2, yeah, and that 4% yield. And on a blended basis, since you originally issued for rebate purposes, you, maybe you're still negative. But yield restriction is the one where, you know, after the end of that three year period, you sort of start afresh. And so we're going to be, you know, under this hypothetical, after July 1, 2024, we kind of just have to look at how much are you earning now and how much do you earn 
as of that date through the, the end of the five years when a yield restriction payment may need to be made. So you lose the benefit of that negative arbitrage from the beginning. Um, I, I mean, I will say there is an ability to sort of waive that temporary period in certain cases, but you have to do that when you originally issued the bonds. And nobody, it, it, if you waive that, you have no ability to earn positive arbitrage. So it, it's very rarely done. But it, it creates a, um, a surprise. You know, you may be looking at it on a blended basis and saying, you know, no, there's no way we've earned positive arbitrage so far. And that may be correct for rebate, but this separate yield restriction calculation, it's a, it's a trap for the unwary. And so it's, um, you know, it's potentially gonna create a liability. You wanna be aware of it. And this is something where that, that opportunity to invest in demand deposit slugs may be a way to manage this issue. So you still have $10 million in your project fund. You have until July 1, 2024 to invest it however you want and qualify for I think we lost uh, John for a second there, but yes, so the idea is that it's until you reach the end of your three-year window, you do have the opportunity to try to earn back some of that negative arbitrage, but it is something that is um, a completely different rule than when we rebate trigger it, the yield restriction period. For purposes of rebate. All right, so um, why don't we go ahead and go to the next case study. And Craig, is it worth just, just looking quickly on the next slide at the you yep. know, history of demand deposit slug rates and why this has become so so relevant after being largely irrelevant for? Yeah, that, great point, Simon. And, and I'll, I'll let you chime in, I'll, I'll tee it up. So again, one of the opportunities that we really wanna share with everybody today is um, the long lost cousin that nobody ever talked about for the last 20 years called the demand deposit slug. It's probably the ugliest name I've ever heard of for an investment, but that's what they have. And as you can see, just over the last five years, and again, this even going back 10 years, we never thought about this as a good investment strategy because it always had a sub market return. Well, starting in the pandemic, as you can see, it hits rock bottom, effectively goes to zero in March of 20. So nobody, of course, everything else was close to zero as well, but we would have never looked at using a demand deposit slug for any kind of an investment strategy. John's already mentioned to you all that this is this gets special treatment as an investment that exempts you from any of the rules, whether it's arbitrage rebate or yield restriction. So you get a hall pass if you can invest in this type of a security and it is, it's liquid, right? So you're literally buying something like it is a money market fund. You're able to get out of it, use it for your projects, whatever, as soon as you want. So as we get through the end of, or the beginning of 2022, we actually, we're ignoring the demand deposit, but lo and behold, because it's following the treasury market, you can see how quickly between early 22 and really June of 23, it skyrocketed to 4%. So this was the sleeper that nobody really was catching on to from a municipal investment strategy, but as it has stabilized for the last nine months, you can see that it's north of 4%. So we believe and are having a lot of conversations with public agencies that are holding on to bond proceeds, whether they're subject to rebate or subject now to yield restriction, as John was talking about um, in our case study of a 2021 bond issue, 
that will, starting the second half of this year, be subject to yield restriction. Looking at a demand deposit as a great alternative to not only kind of take care of the yield restriction um, checking that box, but actually from a dollar perspective and a financial earnings perspective, you're going to be making interest that doesn't, uh, you don't have to pay back or give to anybody. So Simon, you want to add anything else to the? I think that captures sort of as a arbitrage opportunity. This is a, it shows the unique nature of something like demand deposit slot. All right. And so I think I'm back if you can hear me yeah, now. You're good, John. Yeah. I apologize. So, I mean, you may have hit this, but the, the one point I like to say about demand deposit slugs is the investment rate there may be a little bit lower than what you could get in other investments, but you get to keep whatever the difference is between the demand deposit slugs rate and your bond yield. So if your bond yield's two and a half and you're earning four in a demand deposit slug, you get to keep the difference. Whereas maybe you could get four and a half in some other security, but you're going to have to pay down to two and a half. So that's kind of the, the takeaway in my mind. Yeah, great point. Uh, next slide. So we want to pivot a little bit and now have everybody think about in this case study, it's a we're we're talking about getting ready to go to market or a new issuance. And what does this, what strategies should you be thinking about as you put together the bond issue and you think about where you're going to be investing those proceeds? And as we alluded to earlier, um, given today's current market conditions, most likely you're going to be issuing a bond and immediately putting the bond proceeds into an investment that's that could be higher than your arbitrage yield. So you're, you're right out of the gate, you're going to be positive. And again, for all the reasons that you have a temporary period, yes, you can do it for three months or three years, excuse me, and accumulate and then know that you're going to pay that rebate liability back to the federal government and you're five. But you might also think about this a little bit differently than you have in the past which is, okay, well, what can I do knowing I'm gonna make some good interest earnings on my bond proceeds to help lower the overall cost of the project financing or my debt service? And in this case, we're, we're creating a hypothetical that you've, you, you're thinking about it in 2024, you've got a project that you're gonna spend $20 million over three years, um, you're gonna basically go for the first six months um, to the tune of about eight million, so you're you're spending good a good at a good clip, and then you're going to spend six million dollars over the next couple of years. And we would expect that maybe you're going to borrow your arbitrage yield will be somewhere around three and a half percent. Again, alluding to the fact that right out of the gate you are um, most likely going to be earning over four percent. So you're earning half a percent higher than it really costs you to borrow the money. And what what strategies do you want to think about in this scenario to you know potentially look at doing a financing a little differently than you might have even done two years ago? So next slide. And the first one really is this concept of net funding your project. Uh, most of you, if you had a public works director who said, "I need five million dollars for a pump station, you said, okay, I'll go borrow $5 million and I'll just give it to you because it, that'll cover your project and I don't think it's gonna earn much interest. Um, and if it does, that'll maybe cover some of the overage that you have on the project. Now, because we're talking about real interest earnings, there is an idea here to, to actually say, well, maybe I won't borrow the full five, maybe I'll borrow four and a half, knowing that I'm gonna earn a half of a million and interest earnings over the course of the project. So it is it is something, you know, you're borrowing less, right? You're gonna have a smaller debt service going forward and you're effectively, um, you know, minimizing or optimizing how you're funding that project. And John, you wanna talk through the, the rebate ex exceptions on, on this scenario? Well, just on the net funding point, 
you know, I think so many of us have lived for so long with interest rates that were so low in investment rates that I could imagine some some uncertainty about willing to rely on net funding, uh, project fund, out of a fear that suddenly interest rates are going to drop back to zero. Um, but, you know, we don't, in the vast majority of history, we have not been in that situation, but it has been our, our recent history that we've all been dealing with. Um, so, yeah, you know, in a perfect world, you could borrow at that three and a half percent, invest at four, and you would get to keep that difference. But you only get to keep the difference if you qualify for a rebate exception. And under the facts, as we've laid out here, uh, you, you wouldn't qualify because you're not spending everything within 24 months. So, you know, this is a conversation that I've been having with clients that are issuing new money bonds only within the last couple of months of, all right, you know, do you want to issue fewer bonds now, you know, do a couple of bond issues to fund this overall project instead of issuing your project fund that you need for three years, only do it for two years in order to, you know, create the opportunity to earn excess money during that two year period and get to keep it. You know, in our facts here, you're issuing in July 2024, but not going to spend money until January 2025. Do you want to delay a few months in order to make it easier to fit within a potential rebate exception? Uh, you know, is there a way that this project could be accelerated in order to try to fit within the rebate exception and allow you to keep the money? I'll say I don't think any of these are. Um, Things you have to do, you know. If, as Craig mentioned earlier, if you owe rebate, that means you borrowed at three and a half percent, and you got to keep up to three and a half percent that you earned. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It means you were sort of neutral to your cost of borrowing during that time period. Um, but if you can fit within an exception and earn four and get to keep the excess, that is certainly better. So. I try not to let the tax issues kind of drive the business transaction, but when there are situations around the margins where maybe some changes could be made to maximize some tax and arbitrage opportunities, that may be something worth considering. And, and John, I, I would add, you know, from a investment banking perspective, in some sense, we're often having kind of the opposite discussion which is if, if you think about the case study one and we talked about, right, you could issue bonds at two and a half percent, love the yield, super low, but you look at the reinvestment average on that slide, right, and it was 30 basis points for the first year. So I was issuing bonds at two and a half percent. I love my long-term rate, but I feel like we all have been in scenarios where, you know, engineers love to tell everyone they're gonna spend money faster than in practice they actually do. And, you know, bond proceeds sit around longer than anyone, often than anyone expects, right? And so in that first scenario, I'm paying debt service on my bonds at 2.5%, and I'm earning 30 basis points. That, that negative arbitrage or negative carry, it, it doesn't create a rebate liability, but it creates an incremental cost to the bond issue, right? Because it's just a negative drag on the total financing. So in those lower interest rate environments, we spent a lot of time talking to people about timing because there was a, a real negative carry to issuing too early. And if you look at this current case study, you know, I know I can earn at least today well in excess of my bond yield. Maybe I can find a way to keep that positive you know, arbitrage and that's, that's an incremental benefit. But I feel relatively confident that even if I issue for three years of spending, it's very unlikely I'm going to have any negative carry or negative arbitrage on those proceeds. So the confidence I think people have to know they can reinvest the money at effectively their bond yield takes some of that timing consideration out of it if I'm an issuer, because I don't have to worry about this negative arbitrage as an incremental cost on my bond issue. And I think it, it does take some of the need to be really careful about timing out of the equation in a way that's constructive um, for, for issuers, because the relative sort of borrowing costs aren't going to change as much 
of issuing today versus waiting. It's really only going to be driven by you know the difference in market rates and not this incremental cost I would have had to add on to my effective financing rate. So it, you sort of it, it comes up on both sides of the equation with regards to timing. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, and it's sort of a, a countervailing factor in in the situation. All right, do we want to move on to the next uh, example? Yep. So one of the, the sleeper funds that often gets set up when you do a bond issue is capitalized interest. And you, you, know, you, you do it for the sole business purpose of we need to get the project built before it's either going to be generating revenues or we have um, access to it in order to start making lease payments. So often new money project financings will include capitalized interest, which could be one, two, or even up to three years. Again, in the past, we just would, the money that went into the capitalized interest fund would just be gross funded and be potentially in there at zero, half a percent, maybe 1%. What we wanted to do was just give you a hypothetical quant calc on the difference between proactively investing that at 4% versus the you know potentially just a 1% that you were seeing in the in the past and as you can see kind of in red that the that the effective change is $425,000 worth of earnings over a three-year period of time versus a hundred if you were not proactively really investing it in as high a yield as you could possibly get. So um, again, the math is pretty simple. It, it, there, there's no surprises here, but we want to, while we've been talking about percentages for the last hour, it's important to know, you know, what does it mean in real dollars? And so uh, again, looking at the fact that there are so many opportunities, investment opportunities and securities out there that you can get into, whether it's uh, demand deposit slugs or even open market securities, you can see that it can actually add to the bottom line quite a bit, even in a simple scenario like this for your um, overall financial health and or uh, project viability. Uh, next slide. And this is our final case study, which is really talking about one of the, the biggest opportunities from a dollar perspective. And, and I'll just start by saying, you know, refundings, while we've been talking about things like your project fund, capitalized interest, reserve funds, these are small buckets relative to actually a refinancing of an entire bond issue. And, you know, you're generally talking about um, larger dollar amounts than what's sitting around that's remaining in your in your project fund. So again, the the kicker, the benefit of being very proactive in your strategy towards investing money um, can serve to to really um, improve your all, overall savings, you know, present value savings return or cash flow that you get out of a potential re refunding. So we've, we've talked about new money. We've talked about an old project finance that you did back in 2021. And now we're gonna talk about uh, what the benefits are of taking out a refunding or, or refunding an old obligation. So Simon, you wanna summarize this scenario? I will, I'll summarize the scenario. And again, I think to Craig's point, this is another great opportunity for sort of allowable arbitrage that, to me, if we go back to where we started, you know, what is arbitrage investing in one market uh, and then reinvesting in another and earning a, a gain? This is this is a pretty easy one that could apply to almost any bond issue. So in this case study, an issuer is planning to execute a current refunding right in uh, April 2024 uh, with bonds that are callable on any date after May 1, 2024. And you know, not not driven by the rebate rules, but the overall tax rules. We all know for uh, refunding to be tax exempt, it must be a current refunding, right? Meaning there must be no more than 90 days between uh, the, 
when the refunding bonds are issued and when the previously refunded bonds are called. Otherwise, it's an advance refunding, which is no longer permissible. Um, and as John talked earlier, you know, refunding escrows qualify for a 90-day temporary period from yield restriction um, and also likely will but may qualify from a rebate exemption as well. The net impact is that that escrow or those new tax-exempt bond proceeds placed into an escrow account to pay off the old bonds are essentially not restricted with regards to what they can earn. Um, and this is very relevant today because even if you were to invest those proceeds simply in slugs, so you know at the time you're issuing the bonds what your rate will be, the current 90-day slug rate is a 546, I believe. Um, and you know, as we talked about, current tax-exempt borrowing rates maybe in the twos, maybe in the threes. So it's a very easy way for you to issue bonds at two or three percent and invest for 90 days at you know five, almost five and a half percent, and retain that benefit either by selling fewer refunding bonds or or retaining the incremental earnings in the escrow um, at closing. And I think it's important to note in this example, you know, historically we would always think about timing refundings to close on the call date. So we could avoid an escrow because there was a negative cost to that. But that's that's no longer the case. And you are able to do a 90-day escrow, even if that 90th day is not the first call date. So you can have the bonds redeemed as long as the documents allowed after their first call date um, to create this 90-day period to earn the arbitrage on the current refunding escrow. And Craig will talk very briefly about sort of the economic benefit, and then maybe Robert, we can turn it over to questions. I'll just chime in and say I try not to go 90 days just out of a concern that something bad happens and someone fails to actually call the bomb. Um, so 88, 89 days always helps me sleep a little bit better. John, you, you don't like us to have the 90th day be on a Sunday? <laughs> I don't like that. Uh, and, and I I have seen a situation where the bonds were not called on the day they were supposed to be called. So having having had that real world experience, I I try to build in a little cushion. And it's always good to have your tax lawyers sleep well at night. So you know what's a, what what's an extra hundred thousand dollars in interest earnings among friends, John? Just a hundred thousand. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, we'll just put some quick math to this, and then we can close this out for questions. Um, in, in a recent financing or re refunding that was done, it was approximately $49 million. It had an outstanding uh, coupon of about 3.8. So to what Simon was talking about, every day that we delayed paying that old bond off, mm -hmm. the public agency was accruing $7,100 in interest on that old debt. Right, so you think about that, it's, well, don't we wanna pay that off as quick as we can? Well, the fact was that because we could get a slug rate that was at a 553, we actually could make money on just holding on to the 90th day or 89th day if John is involved and earning effectively, you know, a marginally, better or, or greater amount of earnings on that slug. Um, had it been yield restricted, subject to the new bond proceed rate of 3%, you would have you know, effectively been only earning in the $4,000 a day number. So the net benefit of, of letting yourself go out to the 90th day in a current refunding scenario was almost $300,000. And again, this is above and beyond just the traditional, well, you know, I'm, I'm refinancing at a lower interest rate. So my P&I payments on the old deal compared to my P&I on the new deal is something we were able in this scenario to actually improve the overall benefit of the refinancing through a 90 day, as opposed to a 14 day, refunding um, almost $300,000. So again, this is something just to consider. We've all been wired over all these years to just look at only that first call date. We just, 
we peg to that first call date as though it's gospel. And it may be that there's a financial advantage to actually delaying it and taking advantage as, as best you can, um, just to the benefit of being able to invest in a slug at, at a 553 in this example. So I think with that, we are through our case studies and our education. And uh, Robert, we'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, we have a handful of uh, interesting questions here that have come in. Uh, I think this one's directed at John uh, a little bit, but you know, feel free to chime in, uh, Craig and, and Simon. Um, so this question is about some mechanics. Uh, what are the mechanisms in bond documents uh, that make sure issuers have cash to pay the rebate amounts that are due uh, on the applicable five-year payment date? And then kind of related to that, what if the issuer has not been setting aside cash to make the next rebate payment and ends up not having funds available to make uh, the rebate payment when due? Uh, can the issuer come up with a payment plan with the IRS? Are there any other approaches to resolving this issue? Yeah, uh, uh, it's a good question, and it is going to vary wildly by bond documents. Um, I think usually the ones I've seen, you know, uh, a ta the tax certificate will describe Important the security. process for calculus. Your computer has been calculus. locked. Your I uh, the process, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. Uh, the process for calculating rebate, and you know, often there will be a rebate fund either established under an indenture or resolution, or established by language in the tax certificate that provides that the issuer will you know, as rebate amounts become calculated as being due, we'll set aside money in there. But I'll admit, I think often there is, uh, you know, a, a, an, an obligation on the part of the issuer to calculate any owed rebate and to set money aside for that. But I'm not sure how mechanically that often fits together um, in terms of some third party, you know, a trustee or something doing, I, I have not seen anything where the trustee is doing the calculations and sort of setting aside money on behalf of an issuer without the issuer actually taking some action. I think this may be something where, you know, over the last 15 years, it hasn't really been a meaningful concern. And so it may be something to think about in terms of putting procedures in place. I know. I'll say in general, my experience is the procedures are part of post issuance compliance, are part of policies that may be incorporated by reference into the bond documents, but are not often baked into the indenture or other, other you know, or documents. In terms of uh, liability, um, you know, there is the ability to make late payments with interest. Uh, I am not immediately, you know, the idea of a payment plan is not immediately coming to mind. I know that that is something the IRS does in other cases. Um, I'm not saying it hasn't been done for rebate. I just can't think of an example where that has come up. Um, and that may be in part because over the last you know, 15 years, it's been pretty rare for issuers to have rebate liabilities. So we just haven't seen that many, I haven't seen that many situations. Craig or Simon, anything to add on that? Craig, you used to do more rebate. Are you, are you familiar with any situations you've seen where issuers have had to scramble to come up with money and come up <laughs> with any creative solutions? Yeah, there's been um, there there are have have been some situations that I think a lot of them get triggered by a refunding, right? So all of a sudden, r rebate is due within is it. 60 days or 90 days from when the old bonds cease to exist. And that, you know, that isn't necessarily on a five-year bond year period. So um, we've had this situation where we've had to address it as part of a refinancing when there had been an accrued liability or, or rebate liability that's going. Um, I used to joke that the lawyers would always put into the bond documents this rebate fund. Like they'd actually define it as a fund that then the trustee would set it up, but not do anything with it and didn't know what to do with. Obviously, the logic was you did the calculation and you instructed the trustee to move interest earnings from the project fund into it. But uh, I'm going to go 99 out of 100 times right now. That fund, if it is actually set up, it's got zero in it. 
So. So the question um, relative to uh, asking for practical tips on how to invest or how to track, I should rather, investment returns on proceeds invested as part of a local uh, government or statewide pool. What do investment statements uh, for such pools show? Do they give you enough detail to reflect the payments and receipts with respect to the, the gross proceeds invested on a specific issue? Or, um, and, or can payments and receipts not be traced directly to a specific issue? Any thoughts about that? I think that's gonna depend on how your funds are invested. Um, you know, if, if you're getting, if you have a project fund that's invested in LAFE, for example, and you're getting a statement back specific to those project fund investments, then you have pretty good details. But if your money is being invested more broadly and some of that's operating revenue, some of it's other things, you're going to have to do sort of an, an uncommingling to figure out, you know, and I'll say generally that would be on a proportional basis to figure out how much of those earnings relate to your bonds. And John, I'm, I'm there. There's no special rules around a, a lot like LAF, you know, they have a quarterly rate, right? And so it's, there's no obligation of of an agency to go back and imply that there's a monthly distribution of interest earnings. They're going to just actually treat it as earnings on the day they get it from the pool, not on some less than uh, or more frequent basis. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, and, and, you know, this does for entities that are required to invest their bond proceeds through a county pool or, or you know state pool that does limit your ability to take advantage of some of these you know demand deposit slug opportunities if you, if you can't for state law purposes pull your bond proceeds out and invest them separately it's going to be very difficult to um, you know to, to take advantage of certain options instead you're kind of stuck with whatever the investment return is that those pool funds are giving you and you may owe rebate or yield restriction on that basis. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, and I will say as a case study, uh, we have been involved with a couple of public agencies who have moved their money out of LAFE just so that they can then direct the investments, right? Because that, that was a permitted investment to go into LAFE, but likewise they could pull the money back out, not spend it, but reinvest it through the trustee or the paying agent in, you know, directly into something like a, a demand deposit slug. Okay, we have a couple of uh, questions here. I'm going to see if we can hit these quickly um, before the uh, bottom of the hour here. Um, question for clarification about uh, the, the same rules for commercial paper, arbitrage uh, rules, do they apply, how do they apply differently or are they the same for commercial paper? It's a, it's a great question. The, the rules apply the same. As a practical matter, it is often more difficult to meet the rebate exceptions. Um, you know, focusing on the 18 month exception, for example, which requires you to spend 100% of your proceeds within 18 months and, you know, a certain amount by six months and a certain amount by 12 months. Well, if you have a commercial paper program where you issue $100,000 on day one, and then you issue $5 million on a year later, you're not gonna qualify for that rebate exception because you, you, you know, your proceeds didn't come about until some point later. Similar issues can come up for demand, um, uh, drawdown loans where sometimes it is difficult to, to meet these exceptions. The advice I usually give for both of those, and I think many drawdown loans are set up in this way is you know, the proceeds are spent almost immediately. You draw and you spend, or you draw specifically to spend a contractor invoice or something like that. Um, you know, having commercial paper proceeds drawn and immediately spent in reimbursement of, of costs that have just been paid is really the, the best way to avoid any rebate issues and, and, and yield restrictions. Otherwise, if you're pulling a bunch of money and setting it in a construction fund, um, it may be difficult to meet an exception and you otherwise have to continue to track. And, and the only thing I would add there is, you know, our last case study about current refundings, there is an interesting corollary to 
uh, issuers who use CP and then do a new money financing to take that out. The, you know, a similar type of strategy, maybe a little more complex, but could be considered um, for for arbit for earning a, a 90 day arbitrage period when you are using new money proceeds to redeem CP. My only quibble with that is I wouldn't call them new money proceeds because they're refunding proceeds, but for tax yeah. purposes. But yeah, when you're refunding commercial paper, you may think of that as new money bonds, but potentially you have the same 90-day escrow opportunity. All right. Well, we're at the bottom of the hour. <clears throat> um, we're going to close out our program. Before we sign off, first, a, a huge thank you to Craig Hill, John Stanley, and Simon Warecki for your preparations for this webinar and for sharing all your expertise in today's program. Uh, before we sign off, I'd like to quickly draw your attention to a couple of upcoming in-person CDAC programs. Um, on May 22nd in Pomona, CDAC will present current topics and practices in land secured and development finance. This will be a full, full day exploring the current conditions in the land secured uh, sector and, and housing sector, new applications for land secured financing tools and opportunities to couple land secured and tax increment financing tools together. Then in September in Southern California, we're still working on the location, um, but it will be in Southern California, we'll be presenting our three-day full immersion debt essentials program. Uh, this covers everything from pre-issuance uh, planning through post-issuance administration. Um, this program is really targeted at new finance staff. Uh, those that are new to debt management, staff from infrequent issuers, elected officials, but even more experienced finance professionals get a lot of value out of the program. There's always something new to learn uh, when you assemble a faculty of 40 or so experts in a room for three days. So uh, the full program and details, uh, uh, registration information, especially for the Land Secure program, is on our uh, CDAC website. And finally, we'd like to get your feedback about this webinar session. Please spend just a, a few minutes when you receive our post-program survey and tell us what you think. It's all very helpful to us and we appreciate it, uh, we all appreciate it here at CDAC. On behalf of our presenters today and all of us at CDAC, including our education team, Angela Ayala, Trista Zapeta, and Anna Ramirez, I wanna thank you all very much for joining us. Have a great day. <laughs>